In this lecture, we will first discuss the properties of cryptographic hash functions and their applications. We will then look at the structure of a hash function as well as the famous birthday attack that hash functions are vulnerable to. Then we will discuss the need for message authentication and the ways in which we can create message authentication codes today. So a cryptographic hash function accepts a variable length data as input and all this produces a fixed length output. Now this input could be a message or a file such as an image file or a Word document or even a video. This output is commonly referred to as a message digest, hash value, checksum, or fingerprint. For example, this figure shows several input messages that vary in size and their corresponding fixed sized outputs or message digests calculated using SHA-1 hash function. The digest size here is 160 bits or 20 bytes. So each of these values here is 160 bits or uh, 20 bytes. Um, as you can see here, the digest is different for each message. So these four messages here differ in only one or two letters, but their message digests look unique and completely random. Now, cryptographic hash functions have various applications. Uh, they're used to check data integrity or corruption of data. For instance, when you download a software from a website, you usually see a checksum uh, next to the download link, such as this. Here you can see the 256 bits hash value on this Kelly Linux uh, VM download link, uh, which is calculated using the SHA-256 bit hash function. Hash functions are also used for storing passwords in operating systems or even in databases to prevent access to plain text passwords. So instead of storing the password, a hash value of the password is stored along with the username in a password dump file as shown here. So LM and NTLM uh, are hashing algorithms used by the Windows operating system. And so uh, this is one entry um, stored in a password dump file. So there are multiple rows. Uh, one row is per one uh, user account. And so you can see here we have um, a username and then we have one hash value. Then we have another hash value. So one of them is the LM hash, and the other one is the NT LM hash value. So that's the format the password hash values are stored in. Hash functions are also used for fingerprinting to detect duplicate data or to uniquely identify the files. So if two files have the same hash value, this means they are the same files. And although hash functions as is cannot be used for authentication, However, they can be incorporated in other algorithms to achieve authentication. For instance, digital signatures are typically calculated on hash values. Similarly, the hash-based message authentication code algorithms, also known as HMAX, utilize hash functions. We will discuss digital signatures and HMAX later. In order for a cryptographic hash function to be useful for fingerprinting, data integrity, and authentication, it must satisfy some requirements. So this table here shows those requirements. Here, edge refers to the hash function. So the first requirement is a variable uh, sized input, meaning that we should be able to apply the hash function to input data of any size. So it could be one bit, two bits, or one GB. Etc. The second requirement is that the hash function should always produce a fixed size output. The third requirement is its efficiency. So it should be easy to compute a hash value for any input, making both hardware and software implementation practical. The fourth requirement is that the hash function should be a one way function, meaning that it should be easy to compute the hash value h of an input y, but given the hash value h, it should be computationally hard or computationally infeasible to find the corresponding input y. A hash function that satisfies this requirement is also known as pre-image resistant. 
Then there are requirements regarding collision resistance, namely weak collision resistance and strong collision resistance. A hash function is weak collision resistant if for any given input x, it is computationally infeasible to find another input y whose hash value is equal to the hash value of x. Weak collision resistance is also referred to as second pre-image resistance. A strong collision resistance is when it is computationally infeasible to find a pair of inputs x and y such that their hash values are the same. For a hash function to be strong collision resistant, they should be able to protect against birthday attacks, which we will discuss in a while. The last requirement is that the hash values produced by uh, the hash function must be pseudorandom, meaning that they should have a uniform distribution and should be unpredictable. This figure shows the structure used by most cryptographic hash functions. So we first partition the input into blocks of fixed length. Then we process uh, these blocks sequentially, pretty much how we do in block ciphers. Now what block size to be used in uh, the hash function is uh, defined by a specific hashing algorithm. And if the last block has less bits than the block length, uh, then we add uh, padding. And also the last block stores the message length, uh, which is the size of the input on which we are calculating the hash value. Right, so we split our input message into n uh, input blocks. Um, and so bi over here is a specific input data block. Now the heart of uh, this hash function is this compression uh, algorithm. Uh, this is unique to each hash functions. And so it gives a fixed length output. Right, so h1, h2, hn minus 1 and hn all have the same size, which is defined by the hash function. So the compression algorithm takes a data block as input, along with the compression algorithm's output for the previous block. Now, since we do not have a, a compression algorithm's output block for the first input data block, um, so we use an initial value whose size is equal to the compression algorithm output size, or in this case, h1, h2, hn minus 1, and hn. Right, so we use this as h0 essentially. And so the compression algorithm output for the last input data block is our hash value. So in this case, hn is basically our hash value. So this is how we process the input of any size and get a fixed size output. So for instance, Message Digest 5 or MD5 algorithm is one of the older um, hashing algorithms, which is not uh, really recommended to use today because it's uh, not really resistant to collisions. So MD5 divides the message into blocks of 5 12 bits each. Similarly, the compression algorithm output size and therefore also the hash value size is. 128 bits, right? So the compression output algorithm um, gives us 128 bits. So this is 128 bits output for each um, compression function that we're applying here. And the final block stores message length in its last 64 bits. Any padding needed in the last block is done by setting the first bit as one and remaining bits as zeros. So let's say after splitting the input message into blocks of 512 bits each, if the final block has, let's say, only 400 bits, to make it a 512 bit block, we will add padding bits. However, the last 64 bits of this block will store the message length. So that leaves us with 512 minus 64 minus 400 which is 48 bits of padding. So we need to add only 48 bits of padding. So when 400 is added to 48 uh, and 64, we get 512. So we will um, add these padding bits, these 48 padding bits. 
So we will set the first bit out of these 48 bits as 1 and the last 47 bits as 0. Also for the first input data block, because we don't have a previous uh, blocks um, output, so we will use the initial value as input to the compression algorithm along with the input data block, which is also going to be 128 bits. And so again, our hash value is also 128 bits, which is essentially the output of um, compression function for the last input data block. So MD5 is not considered secure today as the output size is small and is prone to collisions. The hash function recommended for use today by the National Institute of Standards and Technology NIST is the secure hash algorithm, referred to as SHA. It was first published as a standard in 1995. However, SHA has many versions. This table shows the parameters of various versions of SHA. So we have SHA-1 and then we have SHA-2 where we have various versions depending on what is the output size for that hashing algorithm. So SHA-1 is also not considered very strong today as the message size is only 160 bits, which is only a slightly uh, bigger size as compared to MD5, which gives 128 bits. SHA-2, on the other hand, is in use today, which has four variants. We have a 224-bit version, which gives us 224-bit output. We have a 256-bit version, which gives a 256-bit output. And then we have a 384-bit version and a 512-bit version. Specifically, SHA-256 is uh, commonly used today, but SHA-384 and SHA-512 are also strong as they have a larger message digest size. Each algorithm has a maximum message size that they can take as input. It is either uh, 2 raised to power 64 or 2 raised to power 128. So although these are pretty large sizes, the reason larger messages than these cannot be processed is because the number of bits used to store message length um, is either 64 bits in the last block or 128 bits in the last block depending on uh, these versions. So the highest value that these bits can store is either 2 raised to power uh, 64 or 2 raised to power 128. In terms of block size, all versions except SHA-384 and SHA-512 um, split the input message into blocks of 512 bits. SHA-384 and SHA-512 uh, split the input data into blocks of 1, 0, 2, 4 bits. So let's look at a popular attack against hash functions. This attack is known as birthday attack. To understand this attack, let's first look at the birthday paradox or the birthday problem. Let's suppose we have a hash function which takes a person as input and calculates their birthday as output. So the hash value here is um, a birthday. The possible birthday values therefore are 1 through 65 since there are only 365 possible days in a year. So 1 here is 1st January and 365 here is let's say 31st of December. So how many people do you think we need to hash to find two people with the same birthday? Or in other words, let's say we have a room full of people how many people do we need to randomly pick to be sure that two of them have the same birthday? Pause here and think about it. The answer is that we only need about 23 people to have a 50% chance that two of them will have the same birthday or have a collision in the birthday. This is approximately equal to square root of 365. Here 365 is the total number of possible hash values. So the birthday attack exploits the mathematics behind the birthday paradox to reduce the complexity of cracking a hash function and finding collisions. Collisions in hash functions are possible in general because the input range is larger than the output range of a hash function as you have a variable length input but a fixed size output. 
So many input messages map to the same hash values. So birthday attack says that for a hash function with n bit hash value, you can find two messages with the same hash value with a 50% probability after you generate about under root of 2 raised to power n or 2 raised to power n by 2 messages. So you don't need to generate all 2 raised to power n messages, which would be the brute force uh, attack scenario. You can find a collision earlier than that. For instance, for SHA-256, we have uh, n is equal to 256 bits because it gives us 256 bit hash values. So only 2 raised to part 256 by 2 messages, which is also under root of 2 raised to part 256 messages, uh, need to be generated to find a pair of messages with the same hash value. Therefore, birthday attack reduces the security of a hash function from 2 raised to power n, which is the brute force scenario, to 2 raised to power n by 2. This can be exploited to, for instance, disguise a malicious program as a legitimate program by ensuring that uh, they both have the same hash value, therefore ensuring integrity when someone downloads the program and tries to verify the hash values. Additionally, the digital signature on the two programs will also be the same since they have the same hash value and the digital signature is calculated on the hash value. So allowing the attacker to use the digital signature for the legitimate program on the malicious program. So here are two programs with uh, the same MD5 hash values. They are different programs, but they're not malicious. So pause here and calculate the hash values on these two programs to ensure that they are same. And try to also find out what each program does by running them via command line or just simply by executing them through their exe files and you can use uh, this link right here to calculate the hash values so you probably noticed that although these two programs have different contents well they're essentially just uh, displaying a different string one is displaying hello world and the other is displaying this message However, their MD5 hash value is the same. In other words, there is a collision. So you could disguise the erase.exe program as the legitimate hello.exe program. So MD5 produces a 128 bit output. So each of this is 128 bits. So its security against uh, collisions is only 2 raised to power 128 by 2 or 2 raised to power 64. Therefore, it is not recommended for use today. So hashing by itself only ensures message integrity but cannot achieve message authentication or verification of the source of the message. Moreover, it is possible that a man-in-the-middle attack changes the data as well as the hash value. So encryption alone only protects against passive attacks such as eavesdropping and it cannot protect against active attacks such as falsification of data or modification of data and transactions. So protection against such active attacks is known as message authentication. So message authentication is a procedure that allows communicating parties to verify that the received messages are genuine and came from an authentic source. In other words, it protects against active attacks. So the important aspects in message authentication are to verify that, that the contents have not been uh, added or deleted, have not been altered, have not been delayed or replayed, and that the source is authentic. To achieve message authentication, we calculate a fixed size message authentication code using a secret key that is shared between um, the sender and the receiver. So the sender passes this key and the message to the MAC calculation algorithm to get a code which they can then add to the message 
and sent over to the receiver. The receiver then checks this back by recalculating it on the received message using the same shared key. So this is the MAC that the receiver calculated. And so then they compare it with the one that they have received. So if they are equal, um, this means that we have ensured the data integrity as well as the source of the data. Message authentication codes can be calculated using block ciphers as well as using hash functions. Various block cipher modes of operation such as counter with CBC MAC, also known as CCM, as well as the Galois counter mode, also known as GCM, let you perform authenticated encryption by calculating the MAC either on the plain text or the cipher text using a shared secret key. You can refer to the modes of operation lecture to know more details on how the MAC is calculated on these two modes of operation. We also have a hash-based message authentication code, which can be used with uh, most hash functions. Let's talk about HMAC. So a number of proposals were made for the incorporation of a secret key into an existing hash function uh, to create a message authentication code. Because at the time, hashing algorithms were faster than um, data encryption standard block cipher which was the standard uh, at the time. So there was an increased interest in developing a Mac derived from a cryptographic hash function. And so HMAC is used in various protocols. For instance, it is used in the IPsec or the IP security protocol. Uh, it is also used in Kerberos as well as other protocols. And it has also been issued as a NIST standard in the FIPS 198 uh, document. So this figure shows the general structure of an HMAC. It works with any hashing algorithm. So this is just a structure. Just like any other MAC algorithm, we need a shared secret key. And in HMAC, we basically calculate the hash value on the data twice using this shared secret key. And we have two padding constants iPad, which is um, the hex value 36, and OPAD, which is the hex value 5C. So first we pad our key with all zero bits so that it is equal to the block size required by the hash function. And then we pad our iPad constant with the hex value 36 until it is also equal to the block size. And then we XOR these two blocks together to get our new block, which is here referred to as I keypad. So this is just an output from XORing the key block with the iPad block. We do the same thing with the OPAD constant by making the key block first and then the OPAD block, and then XORing them together to get a new block. Then we append our I keypad block with plain text or data and calculate its hash value. Finally, we append this hash value with the O keypad block, which is this one, and calculate hash value again. So this second hash value is what is known as our HMAC. So again, first we concatenate our message with the I keypad block and calculate a hash. Then we can concatenate that hash value with our O keypad block and recalculate the hash on it. So that's our HMAC. You can calculate hash values as well as HMAC using OpenSSL. So it has support for both. So pause here and try calculating the hash value and HMAC on some file uh, using OpenSSL. So here are the commands that you can use. So just replace um, the path to the file here as well as here. And you can also change the secret key for HMAC.